for those of you who don't know, I was chairman of the Northwood Norwich University Hospital um, for Fort Worth for 13 years. Um, I was the MP for North Norfolk, but I haven't been in politics now for 14 years. I haven't even been a member of, cons of the Conservative Party for, for 12 years. So um, I don't feel myself as a politician anymore. But I have huge sympathy for politicians. I don't, Norman is not here. Um, I think we expect too much of our politicians. Um, I'm just going to, uh, Martin said things were going to get tough, were tough, and we're going to get tougher. This, these are the figures that um, George Osborne or Ed Balls or anyone who's serious in politics, politics will be looking at. National debt, 1.4 trillion pounds. Uh, interest alone is 42 billion pounds a year. The current budget deficit, after all the cutbacks, all the pain that we think we've had, 100 billion pounds a year still. The required extra funding for the NHS just to keep pace with current demand, 30 billion pounds a year extra by 2020. And for social care, another 5 billion. And that's not including the costs of the Dilnot reforms, proposed reforms. I mean, this is not sustainable. But anyone who thinks that there's more money coming into the system, or any significant new money coming to the system, is frankly deluding themselves. Uh, there may be a few billion, one or two billion here and there, but nothing like the money uh, that is required to fund that gap. That gap has got to largely be met, that 30 billion pound and that 5 billion pound gap has largely got to be met through what is euphemistically called efficiency savings. Now, you can squeeze a lemon so many times. I mean, you can order your rubber gloves from a better supplier so many times, frankly. You're not going to find that kind of saving. The only way you're going to get that kind of saving is through a different system. And let me give you two examples in an acute hospital of where this waste is. And it affects everyone in social care as well, this. If you go into an acute hospital on a Monday morning, into the canteen, what you'll find there on a Monday morning are 30 or 40 anaesthetists and 20 or 30 surgeons. And they'll be in the canteen because they can't start operating because their surgical beds are full of medical patients. They are full of elderly people with long-term conditions, usually with dementia, who will be in surgical beds. The second area I will point out is a major area of waste. If you will find that a hospital like the Norfolk and Norwich today and indeed any acute hospital today, there will be at least 50, probably nearer 100, what are called delayed discharges. These are people who are absolutely ready to go home. Their care plans are ready, but they cannot be discharged. And there will be many more than that in that hospital. You'll find, I was told this, early this morning, that 34% of all the patients in the Norfolk and Norwich have got dementia. Um, that is 340 beds in the Norfolk and Norwich of people who have got dementia. Now, do acute hospitals look after people with dementia well? Can they look after them well? I mean, what, what is the worst place to be if you've got a long-term condition and you've got dementia? It is probably an acute hospital. Now, of course, there will be times when your health breaks down badly and you need a short stay in an acute hospital. But people are in acute hospitals for weeks. So this is a system issue that we've got. It's not, a, it's not a question of squeezing the lemons, frankly, anymore. It's a system issue, and uh, I'll come to that later on. But I'll just leave you with one phrase before I move on. And it came out of the 2000 plan. It was, a, it was a Tony Blair's 2000 plan, and he talked about the NHS and the social care. And he said, we have a 1940s system in a 21st century world. And it's, to me, that sums it up. We have got a 1940s system in a 21st century world. We have a system which was designed for treating people in 1940, not in 2015. And the kinds of patients that we have today in 2015 are completely different from the kinds of patients that we had in 1948. That is a frog. Um, that is you. This is a frog sitting outside a pan of boiling water. And if that frog jumps into that pan of boiling water, it will either die immediately or it will jump out. But if you put that frog into a pan of cold water 
and gradually heat it up. To start with, the frog doesn't notice because its own body temperature goes up until the water gets to a boiling point, at which point it dies. Now, this frog, you, have been in this water for five years, and the water is getting hotter. Well, that is just one way of looking at it. In 2008-09, 1.8 million people were receiving local authority-funded social care. In 2013-14, that was just over 1.2 million. If that trend carries on, it'll be down to 800,000 in four or five years' time. Now, what is happening to these people that were receiving this care? And this is the, the other side. This is the, this is the health side. Since 1950, we've been receiving 4% uh, increases in health in real terms over that time. And you can see it's been up and down, but the trend there is between 3 and 4%. For the last five years, it's been around 1% or below. It just kept in, in pace with inflation in real terms. If that carries on for another five years, you can see what that graph will look like. So both in health and social care, there has been this huge squeeze on spending, and it's going to carry on. So I want to turn to the CQC now before I come back to this um, at the end. Failure is ubiquitous. It doesn't matter whether it's Tesco's or Southern Cross or, or Midstaff's or the co-op. Wherever you look in life, big companies, small companies, public companies, charities, there will be failure. It is inevitable that there will be failure. There will be care homes that fail. There will be hospitals that fail. And when care homes and hospitals fail, the consequences for individual lives are very profound. So that is our first role in CQC. It is to find failure. It's to try and find failure before it does too much damage. So we are in the minimum standards game. And it's important that we all know that. We are in the blame game. We are in the closing down. We're in the warning notice game. And we have to be there because the consequences of not closing down care homes and delivering bad care are too great. So we are in the blame game. Now, where do things go wrong? Where do things tend to go wrong? They tend to go wrong when organizations put finance before patients or before residents. Uh, we've seen that, um, and I, you know, we've seen that, it, we saw that at mid-staffs. You know, they wanted to become a foundation trust. That was more important to them than looking after the patient. What we in CQC are saying is, actually, no. We're not going to let people put finance ahead of patients or residents. We are putting the interests of the patient or the resident first. So finance is the first thing. If, if finances get tough, you've got to look out, because quality then often suffers. Staff engagement, absolutely critical. If your staff are not engaged, you will not deliver great care. I mean, Three weeks ago, we did an inspection of a hospital, a major hospital. 70% of the staff would not recommend that hospital to their family or friends. Now, would you want to send your relative to that hospital? So staff engagement, and particularly in hospitals, clinical alignment between clinicians and management is absolutely crucial. The culture of organizations. If, if organizations are defensive and inward looking, they're probably delivering bad care. You know, how do we deal with complaints? How do we listen to people's staff who've got genuine concerns? Those are the kinds of things that we'll be looking at when we do inspections of care homes and hospitals. And isolation. Where organizations are isolated geographically or intellectually, problems can happen. We, we don't like to see a small DGH acute hospital without, which does not have links, for example, to a teaching hospital. It's much more difficult to recruit staff, and people become much more inward looking. And then finally, weak and changing leadership. If you've got constantly changing senior management, uh, that is not a good indicator. Now, I say they're leading indicators of failure. They tend to indicate failure. They don't, always they don't always actually deliver failure, but those are the kinds of things that we're looking at. Just taking two of those, it, two of those issues. This was the work that the King's Fund did with us looking at Mid-Staffordshire and looking at the correlation between job satisfaction 
and patient experience. And actually, we've done a lot of work on this, and the correlation between all these measures of staff engagement, whether it's bullying, engagement, um, job satisfaction, with outcomes is a very close one. It makes business sense to engage your staff. And the second one I would pick out is, is leadership. Now, this is a correlation between um, compliance with CQC's judgments and having a registered manager in place. If you don't have a registered manager in place, that is a, a matter of huge concern to us. If there's no leadership in a care home, then that is a matter of huge concern to us. So, minimum standards is part of what we do. But we're also interested in improvement. I mean, improvement, at the end of the day, uh, is going to uh, be of interest to 97% of care homes. I mean, we are, the, 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 minimum, um, the minimum standards part of our work is just that bottom three or four or five percent. What we're really interested in is getting improvement. So, intelligent transparency, we want to put it out there. We want the consumer, the resident, the patient, and their families to be able to make an informed choice about which care home they should go to. So that is what I mean by intelligent transparency. We will be putting ratings on, on every organization that we go to, outstanding, good, requires improvement, or inadequate. It will allow care homes to benchmark with other care homes. It will allow the consumer to make an informed choice. This is a, this is a dis description of our new approach. I just ask you to focus on that middle wheel there. Those are the, the five aspects that we will be focusing on when we go on an inspection. And my colleagues in CQC have got to stand here today and are very happy to talk you through this in more detail. But we're looking at whether a home is safe, whether it's effective, whether it's caring, whether it's responsive uh, to patient residents' needs, and whether it's well-led. That, that is uh, a very short description of our new approach. It is going to be much more forensic, much more detailed, much more holistic than our past inspections. Um, our, inspection, our inspectors will be specialist inspectors. They will all focus in your area, not across the board. Uh, we believe that, we, that our inspection reports will be much, much better than they were in the past. And that is as a summary of the, of the we, we started in October under, under this new regime. Uh, and that is a summary of, of the results so far, that out of, I think, 41 inspections, 26 were good, um, 10 were required improvement, six were inadequate. Now, we are tending to focus on the, the homes that we have concerns about to start with. I would expect when we've done 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 homes, that those ratios will change. I would expect the inadequate ones to be in sort of roughly the 5% area, I would think. So I want to just end, really, um, with what I think are the important issues. Um, and I just repeat, the NHS is a 1940 system operating in a 21st century world. That was written in 2000. Not much has changed in the last 15 years. Um, in 2000, when that was written, we had money. You know, the NHS plan was backed with huge amounts of money. Spending on the NHS alone went up from 30 billion to nearly 100 billion, and we did not get the system change. We're now facing doing it with no money, and maybe that's better. It, it may be the lack of money is going to force the change that has to happen. Um, I, I was talking to someone in a, who runs a big private nursing home group last week, and he said, look, just do the maths. It costs £3,000 a week to have someone um, in, in, a, in a geriatric MFE ward in a hospital. It costs £1,000 a week to have them in a nursing home. That is a huge difference. And frankly, for that person, they will get better care, by and large, in a nursing home than they will in a busy, acute hospital, which is not designed to look after people with chronic long-term conditions. And I think you need to lock Jonathan Fagg here, Harold Bobmer, Anna Dugdale, and the others into a room and sort this. Um, you will, we all find, I know, I can predict 
there will be a crisis in beds. This, there's a crisis in beds the whole year now in acute hospitals. There will be a double crisis. If we get a hard winter, there will be a double crisis. There will be ambulances in the car park. There will be patients in side rooms without the proper facilities. It is inevitable that that will happen. We know it's going to happen. And we also know that many patients who are in medical beds in an acute hospital can be looked after at less cost and better outside the acute sector, whether it's in a community hospital or whether it's by putting more support for them in their own homes or whether it's in a, in a, whether it's in a nursing home. It seems to me we can talk about structures and systems and integrated care and accountable care organizations. We can talk about it for another 15 years. And we probably will, but it's, we've just got to move people out of acute hospitals into the places where they are, can best be looked after. For us, consistency, I think, is the biggest issue. You know, we have got, when we do our inspections, they have got to be consistent. You know, when we go to a care home that's looking after people with dementia in Norfolk and give them a rating, that has got to be comparable with one in Cornwall or in London. It's going to be really difficult for us to do that. We've got lots of quality assurance um, sort of mechanisms in place, but we'll need your help to do that. I mean, we are not going to be perfect. We are not a perfect organization. Uh, we need to work with you who, who we regulate to make ourselves better. And you have got to feel free. Well, you have concerns about us. You've got to be able to be free to raise them with me and others in CQC without any fear that by raising concerns, that'll be held against you. We, we have got to have an open, transparent relationship with, with, with all of you. And identifying risk. I mean, we have got what we call an intelligent monitoring system. We, we, we follow risk. It's quite easy, or relatively easy, to look at risk in acute hospitals because there's more information. And there's only 160 acute hospitals in, in England. Uh, we follow them. We look at 160 different metrics. We look at risk all the time. We look at mortality. Uh, we look at complications, we look at uh, readmissions. There's lots of statistics we can look at to identify risk much harder in your sector. There are 22,000 different providers of, of social care that we regulate. Incredibly difficult for us to be sure that we are identifying risk. But some of you will know where it is. You know, we, we found in primary, in primary medical care, for example, when we go into a, 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 into a GP surgery, which is inadequate, and we say it's inadequate. The number of times other doctors come to us and said, we could have told you that 10 years ago. You know, if you know of areas where you've got concerns and you hear about it, for goodness sake, um, let us know. And then lastly, money, um, which I think I've, I've done to death. Money is a, gonna be a huge issue, but if we use it right, it could be a huge driver for, for change. And then finally, I just, I would like to add on that. I mean, we were a compliance organization. We used to come into your homes and look at two or three, sometimes four, sort of compliance issues, um, and we would tick it or not tick it. We were a compliance-based organization. We are now looking at the culture of the organizations because we feel and believe that it's the culture that will determine the performance in the long run of a home or a hospital. So CQC has changed and is changing and will carry on changing. And uh, as I say, the feedback we get from you will be hugely helpful. Thank you very much.